the music room at the Longhorn in Minneapolis, and it's been a thrilling night. In fact, um, as part of the audience, I think I sit here completely covered from an audio point of view, and I think I got the rest of it by osmosis. Howard Roberts has been out front, but he's been supported by some unique players from the jazz scene here in Minnesota. Howard, uh, I think you've taken me from the land of funk and go floor show cully all the way around to, uh, oh, I don't know, some mathematical wizardry in the land of freedom and discipline called the free form. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Lay. It's, I'm really glad you liked it, man. It's a... Uh... Well, uh, thanks. <laughs> well, I sit out here in the audience, and I'm, I'm, I'm a part of it, and I often think um, up there where you're conducting in sort of the central force and figure, if there aren't images of Segovia perhaps uh, racing around and perhaps even Django Reinhardt. That's right, all that, all that stuff. Uh, and this kind of music we're playing here, it's uh, all hooked up with, I think, the whole history of music, really. I don't want to get philosophical on you know, uh, with this tired old question of what is jazz, but one of the things it might be is a catch-all word for uh, improvised, innovative things. And uh, usually these things uh, are combinations of music that's already existed somewhere in the past. Of course, and yeah. brought together in time and space. Yeah, essentially, right. And, uh, and here we co have an extraordinarily... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, a very extraordinarily hip mu uh, group of musicians here in Minneapolis. Uh, all the players in the group are of that uh, vent, they're of that point of view. They all have a wide respect for the whole history of jazz. Uh, they're not turned off by rock and are easy to move in that direction. They can go in the bossa nova direction without any qualms. Uh, they've got classical technique uh, behind them. and. This is, it's kind of a, uh, well, golly, I, I know we don't have much time to talk here, so I don't really want to open up a great big old subject on you, but... I think you should, but we'll come back to it in just a moment. I, I really think that, um, really, if musicians ran the stock market today, we might have, uh, we might end up on the positive side, because you <laughs> certainly can count <laughs> when lost in space. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the Dow Jones averages could, you know, you really use a monitor uh, like you and the, the rest of the group here. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. It's a, well, that, the, the idea has crossed my mind. Uh, not that musicians ought to go into the political field by any, by any means, but uh, it has occurred to me that everybody running for a political office, uh, maybe it ought to be mandator mandatory for them to listen to Buddy Rich first to find out how to get it done uh, now. <laughs> Howard Roberts, thank you very much. Uh, an excellent comment. And of course, music being a part of the humanities and an important force in that mainstream, it, it pushes along socially, commenting on the times. Thank you. I appreciate that. I feel that way too. Howard Roberts, and a engaging, magnetic, forceful, and dynamic night. We've been immersed here from decibels, well controlled all the way around to some very soft and easy and pleasant things that move us through a mathematical but romantic aisle every once in a while. Oh, that's beautiful, man. That's wild. <laughs> Howard Roberts, thank you much. Thank you. Jazz in Minnesota this night electrified from the amplifier of a guitar and surrounded by Eric Gravatt, uh, a timekeeper, and Billy Peterson at uh, yeah. Amplified Bass and Bobby Peterson part of a magic family in this area. Really? Howard Roberts. Yeah. Blake, don't for, for, uh, Lay, don't forget uh, Bobby uh, on saxophone. Robert Rockwell the third, blowing from soprano to the... Uh, yes, indeed. A night with Howard Roberts. The place is the uh, music room of the Longhorn Restaurant in Minneapolis with St. Paul just across the river. And in this growing community growing with cultural force from the Minnesota Symphony, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Jazz has moved off the back streets into some really fine environment and of course the force really behind it is the musicians who plan it, program it, and execute it. Howard, it certainly is a privilege to sit in with you and see the mix between uh, musicians of, uh, of this earth and this locale like the Petersons, like Robert Rockwell, 
who are really a part of this community and growing here and to see the force of your professionalism and your discipline which has been nurtured I suppose from the free form of the West Coast School to the discipline of the studios yes just a few comments concerning the musicians you sat in with literally tonight that's right you want me to comment yes well they're all fantastic every one of them uh, are there on each of their instruments I can't think of a better player anywhere uh, in the, in the whole country and uh, Minneapolis is uh, very fortunate to have these guys here uh, and it's nice of you by the way and it's we're fortunate to have people like you lay and your program and your your uh, radio stations to uh, uh, bring these guys to the attention of the people who live here it, it would be so easy for them to be lost you know and and not known and and just move away and go to LA or New York like, like everyone else and it's a delight to come out here and, and uh, and fine guys of this caliber. And I mean, I'm surprised, too. Well, jazz in the provinces here in the hinterland uh, certainly can be exciting. And when you consider Minnesota and then think about maybe Madrid, Spain, and listen to a Pedro Iteralde or mm -hmm. swing around to Ronnie Scott's club and catch not just Americans on the stand in London, but uh, uh, a few exciting players like perhaps a, a stray keyboard artist like Marcel Salal or or the memorable Renee Thomas, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. then uh, life becomes uh, exciting because you know there's a link from one country to the other and from one province to the next. Well, I guess uh, uh, actually it's a tired old uh, term that uh, music is a universal language and uh, I think that's probably an understatement. Uh, I, I, and actually we don't have, to have time to go into the, all that and I'm really just kind of confirming what you've already so eloquently said. I've been in the music business for a lot longer than I care to recall and I have found this to be the case that um, if the music is good and put together with integrity it doesn't matter if it's spacey outside inside down home whatever you want to call it funky anything else if it's done with integrity and done well anybody with his head screwed on right is going to be communicative with that thing and it doesn't matter what language he speaks or, or anything else. It's just, um, well, my old comp, comp uh, I almost said competition, composition teacher, uh, he says, uh, one, one day I came in with an assignment and I was feeling kind of down about a piece for a symphony orchestra and I didn't like what I'd done. He said, don't feel badly. He says, you're consorting with the gods. Uh, he said, uh, you're dealing with, uh, with the most advanced art science in the world. And the search for the elusive melody has got to be one of the challenges to put it in any form or shape. Well, you really put your finger right on it. Uh, uh, a melody finding is the name of the game. And uh, you look back over the years at the masters of that, and there aren't that many. <laughs> really. It, you'd, you'd think, well, gee whiz, it's Julian nowadays, all you got to do is turn on the radio. People used to ask me, you know, uh, and they still do, uh, whatever the popular artist of the day is, you know, whether it's the Beatles or, or whoever. And they'll say, uh, well, what impact do you think that they're going to have on music? And I have to back off and say, I don't know. Uh, let's put 20, 30 years on it, and then we'll all know. And everybody's looking for melodies in the end game, I think. And it is certainly one of the most uh, frustrating challenges for any composer or player. Mm -hmm. Very definitely. Very definitely. I wonder if the same doesn't hold for the visual artist who's always looking for the color and form to make the image. I don't know. I suppose I, I, I think I'm sure there are there there are uh, connections between those things. Uh, I've tried to ma to make those connections uh, in objective uh, terms before. I was unsuccessful. They seem to be more uh, aesthetic in nature, uh, but I'm sure that they, they they are related. Yes, I'm not very. Uh, uh, very fluent in discussing their relationship. That's the kind of thing where we'd have to sit around and drink about 30 or 40 beers and uh, <laughs> get very esoteric, you know what I mean? <laughs> or call for Gunther Schuller yeah, and ask him those. to relate uh, one of those uh, relate the audio <laughs> to the visual. Right. <laughs> Howard Roberts, thank you ever so much. Thank you. The guitar is a warm and haunting instrument. It make you think of flamenco dancers. It might think you of olives in Spain and Sherry, and it might just uh, make you think of the Benny Goodman sextet, Count Basie and Charlie Christian, or maybe the quintet of the Hot Club of France. And at the moment, though, the image 
with um, AC, alternating current, uh, an amplifier. Sometimes, uh, you know, gives you a totally different view. It's electric, it's modern, it's contemporary. Howard Roberts, you, you've run the gamut. Who are some of your influences as far as this marvelous instrument, the guitar, is concerned? Okay, uh, that's a large subject, considering that I've been playing the guitar for 35 years, right? The guitar has been around longer than the violin. It's been the national instrument of many, many countries, many, many times. It's been growing in popularity since the day it was in, uh, built, for, from day one. It's never seen a downtrend. It's always been up. Uh, there are estimated to be 30 to 40 million people in the United States that own guitars. Okay? Everything has influenced me. Uh, everybody I've ever heard. Uh, naturally, when I started out, uh, I was influenced by those around me uh, at that time who could play basically country guys and uh, amplified guitar was just coming into the picture and there were the good single string electric guitar players in the world or single string players electric or not uh, you could count on your hand on one hand you had charlie christian you had jangle reinhardt uh, you had a guy guys like uh, george van epps a, a total monster so anyway uh, i've been influenced by in my early stages uh, of learning to play, I did like most people. I copied everybody there was to copy. I came on the scene just about the time that Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie were making, and people like that, a lot of people in New York, were making a considerable impact in the way improvising was being done. So my influences at that point shifted over to saxophone, trumpet, and piano players, and has pretty much remained so, except for... Uh, classical composers and I gotta say that those some of those guys have had probably the heaviest impact on me uh, of anyone uh, the Bartok uh, string quartets for example uh, are some of the heaviest music I've ever heard and that's been the case for 25 years I cannot get those things out of my mind and if I had to put my finger on a single strong influence I'd have to say it's somewhere between the Bartok string quartet and T-Bone Walker you know, it really, it's that big a range. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it speaks for a man with universal feelings and taste. And yeah. Howard Roberts, uh, you to handle a question about influences like this after 35 years of facing it. I thank you for giving the broad range. It speaks for uh, humanity and, and music. Thank you. I appreciate that, Lay. That's nice. Howard Roberts, and a pleasure to hear. Uh, a marking of influences that range from T-Bone Walker to a Bartok Quartet. This is Lake Hammond reporting.